Today's scripture reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the time of salvation. We put no stumbling blocks in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we command ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness, in the right hand, and in the left, through glory and dishonor, that report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wild our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affections from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Uh, it's really nice to. Uh, yeah, I see everyone in person like this, and you know, just like how Pastor Norman said last week, it's so so much better to preach to the real people than to my phone here. I used to be standing here, preaching to my phone, imagining, you know, your faces, and uh, I'm really happy to see you all. So let's pray for the message. Let's open our heads. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this morning, for allowing us to worship you come before your throne of grace. Father, in the time of confusion, in the time of darkness, Father God, we confess that many times we are not able to see where your grace is, where you are. And like the psalmist, Lord, we often pray to you, how long, O Lord? Or, where are you, Lord? Or, why have you forsaken me? So, Father, I pray that through this message, through your Holy Spirit, you'll open our eyes to see where you are in our lives, where you are working and how your grace is working powerfully, not in the future, not just in the past, but now, here and now in our lives. Father God, would you touch our heart, soften our heart to receive your word of truth, Father God, whatever you say to us, Father God, may we be a people that can receive your word. Father God, I pray that you will shine your light upon us, upon our hearts, to see and taste the goodness of Jesus this morning. Father, I pray that through the Holy Spirit, they will touch our heart, soften our heart, to receive your word of truth and be glad. Father God, we thank you. We look to you. We devote this time to you. This is time is yours, oh God. So, so speak to us freely and powerfully. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. After Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, all human beings have this inherent tendency to judge the world in two ways, which is in good and evil. We tend to see people or events in our lives by dividing everything into two groups. Good people, bad people, good events, bad events, happiness, sadness, moments of joy, moments of tears, success and failures, but as we live our lives, we realize 
that our lives are much more complex. And it's really kind of hard to define some people or some events in our lives in that binary judgment. Some people in our lives, for example, are not perfectly good, <laughs> but they're not really bad as well. Some events in our lives are not like that sweet, but it's not that bitter. And we say it often so well to, to describe this reality of our lives. We say what? We say, it's bittersweet. It's bittersweet. This paradox is in fact what God is constantly telling us through his word. Let me ask you this. Do you think Christians are good people or bad people? If they're good people, why did Christ have to die on the cross for them? If they're bad people, how can they have fellowship with God? Are they sinners or children of God? Is Christ's death on the cross a good event or horrible event? As Christians, are you obeying God every day or sinning every day? When you look at the cross, do you feel thankful or feel broken inside? You see now in our faith journey, we're always standing in this middle ground, this eclipse and this, in, in this paradox. We Christians are like dancing in the rain. We are always standing in this middle ground. We're living in this paradox every day. This paradox is, ex explains about <clears throat> what the grace of God truly is and how it's working in our lives. Let's take David in the Bible, for example. Not David here, but um, David in the Bible. I know that a lot of parents name their children as David. I mean, Esther and I, in the future, not now, but in the future, when we have a second baby, uh, we plan to name our kid as David too, if it's a boy, <laughs> because we want to name all of our children with the same meaning, which is beloved. And I know that the meaning of the David, uh, the name David is also beloved. Why do we love to name our kids after people in the Bible? Because of course, you know, we want them to be like them, you know, just learning about how God has so much favor on them, how God used them and, you know, just their story inspires us. But there's always that the other side of eclipse that we miss. David, after he became a king, we know that he committed this horrible sins. He committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba forcefully, and to cover up his sin, he killed her husband, Uriah, who was faithful to serve his king. Let's take a moment to see this, not just a story in the Bible, but it's just as a real scenario, like real life example. Let's just say that you're the family members of Bathsheba or Uriah. Let's just think about this happen in your life. How would you feel? What would you say about David? Is he still a rightful king of Israel? Is he still beloved worshiper of God? I mean, would you still want to name your kid as David? Certainly, you don't want your kids to be murderer or committing adultery. And what title that God gave to him? It's interesting. A man after God's own heart. So how can David be murderer, adulterer, and at the same time, a man after God's own heart? And that's the reality of Christian life. In a situation like this, we bring our binary judgment again and we say, oh, David must not be a, a truly a man of the God's own heart. Maybe God made a mistake or maybe that changed, you know, maybe that, that, that title was kind of taken off after he did something. Or some, other, some others will say, um, what David did was really, um, it was nothing. I mean, he was a king. So, you know, a lot of kings at that time did what David did. So, 
No, it's okay trying to diminish what David did, which was evil in the eyes of God. Isn't this how we usually see and judge and understand our lives? Good or evil? That our perspective is often limited to understand the grace of God, and the death of the gospel that's working in our lives right now. I pray that through this message that our eyes will be open to see the grace of God is working so powerfully in this paradoxical life that we are living. In many moments, we feel like the grace of God is not working. That's when the grace of God is working. Let's look at verses um, 3 to 4 of our passage. Paul says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. What's happening in this passage is the Apostle Paul's writing the second letter, I mean, which is Second Corinthians we're reading, uh, to the church of Corinth, the church he planted himself to address some issues in church. The most important issue that he wanted to point out was that people in the church were challenging Paul's apostleship. Uh, saying, you're not a true apostle. You're not a true messenger of God. They were saying, if you're a true apostle, how can you also have so many weaknesses in your character? If you're a true apostle, how can you be poor when you're doing God's work? God is not providing to you. How, how can it be that your speech skill is un, un, unimpressive? God has not given to you. How can you live a life of endless suffering in your life? As we see, Paul, when, you're, when you claim that you're doing something that pleases God, how can you have so much hardships and suffering? And Paul is responding to these people in verses 3 to 4 we, that we just read by confidently saying, I am a true servant of God. Don't make my weaknesses get in the way of ministry. Don't let that be an obstacle. I commend myself to you still. We see Paul's confidence despite of all the criticism that he received. And we ask, how can he be so confident? I mean, all the contents of the criticism that he got were not false. Were not really false. I mean, he was indeed weak in many ways. Uh, poor, and his speech skills was not impressive, and going through all kinds of sufferings in ministry that made people think as if Paul was doing something wrong. Let's continue to uh, look at how Paul was responding, verses 4 to 5. Uh, you got the slide there. Let's actually read together, okay? One, two, three. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. Can we read it again with a loud voice? Okay, let's read it again. One, two, three. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. He's listing out all of his suffering. He's not, hiding them out. He's not hiding them at all. He is showing them to God that this, yes, you're right. I'm having all these weaknesses, sufferings, and hardships in my life. And this is actually the list of what I'm going through. Look at it. He's not hiding it at all. He's showing it to the people. He actually extends this list later in chapter 11. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at it. For this, it's a long passage. I read it for you. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings. And often near death, he's explaining what his life. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day, I was, I, I was adrift at sea, on freaking journey, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger from every, everything. 
Danger, danger, danger. Danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, there are many asleep this night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. I mean, what in the world is happening to his life? He was just trying to do what? Trying to do the work of God. And all these things were happening. And this is, this is exactly why uh, the Corinthians were telling Paul, you're not a true apostle. You're not a true minister. You know, if you're a true apostle doing something that pleases God, how can you have all these experiences in your life? I mean, isn't that kind of how we naturally think as well? Um, something bad happens in our lives. Or when we see someone going through some hardships, just like the friends of Job, now sometimes we naturally, we don't, maybe you don't really say it out because you're very gentle. <laughs> and you're like, you know, full of respect. Um, yeah. um, we're not saying it out, but, you know, we think that, oh, maybe that person did something wrong. That's kind of how the friends of Job kind of constantly challenge Job, right? He must have done something wrong. No, grace of God is not in your life. God has left you. But the reality was different. The reality was that God was right before. In, um, Job was in the presence of God all the time. So just imagine these uh, kinds of things happen in our, let's say, all of us in the future, I believe, we'll go to like, what, short-term mission trip. And let's just say, imagine that... Uh, all these things that Paul is uh, listing out, these things happen in your life, I mean, in your trip. Let's say that uh, you go to like a local mission and then you're gonna get on the bus and with your team and then on your way, the bus is broken down. What would you say? We would say that, oh, maybe um, this wasn't really the will of God. Oh, maybe uh, we didn't pray enough or maybe, mm, you know, maybe we have to uh, think of our plan B. But Paul wasn't like that at all. He pushed, he pushed through because he was able to see the grace of God working in a situation like that. In the middle of these horrible events, this is what Paul was experiencing. Let's look at uh, our passage again, verses 6 to 7. Okay, let's read it together. One, two, three. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. In the middle of his weaknesses, suffering, and his horrible events, he was experiencing the Holy Spirit. Keeping him pure, giving him the right knowledge, providing him such patience, kindness, genuine love. In the middle of the darkness, he was equipped and empowered by God with the weapon of the righteousness to do the ministry and discharge the duty that God has given him. His whole life was bittersweet. It's not like a flowery road. It was more of a wilderness with the pillars of clouds and fire, with the manna coming down from heaven. He was experiencing God in the time of Dryness, suffering, and hardship. That was his life. Yes, we see. Let's keep reading from verse uh, 8. Let's read it together again. One, two, three. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, you are treated as impostors. You are true. In his life, there's a group of people praised him. But another group of people criticizing him at the same time. Paul is the same person, people reacting in different ways. He's treated as imposter, as a liar, yet what he was saying was true. Verse 9, uh, as unknown and yet well known as dying and behold will live as punished and yet not killed. Paul was nobody in the eyes of many people and he was just this you know, some people, of course, would think that this is a crazy guy talking about the way, you know, talking about what? What was his name? Jesus? 
no? Then he gave his life for it. When nobody was praising him, nobody was there for him. He would just live his life as a tent maker and fulfill the ministry. But in the eyes of God, in the eyes of God, he was the greatest Christian ever lived on this planet, the chosen vessel of God who wrote, who wrote a half of the New Testament that we are reading today. God gave a mission. Let's look at the next verse as well, um, verse 10. It's an important verse, so let's read it together. One, two, three. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. You see the paradox there? We are, Paul was, all of us, we Christians are, sorrowful and always rejoicing. We are like poor, but we are making many rich. When we look at our lives, we might feel many times that, oh, my life is not that blessed. But interestingly, people in my life get, get blessed through me. When we look at our lives, we might feel like, I don't really have anything in this world, but we have everything in God. That's, that's who we are. And that's how Paul was. Christians are such sorrowful people, yet happiest people on this planet. Are you sorrowful or are you happy in God? Maybe the answer is you are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing in Him. This is what Paul meant when he also said later in chapter 12 about how he was asking God to remove the thorn of his flesh. He said, so to keep me from uh, becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. You see, okay, a lot of scholars debate over this, you know, what this thorn, you know, some say that was like a personal disease or, you know, or a group, or group of people harassed him or anything, but whatever that is, it's that imperfections that he had in his life, which he thought that that shouldn't exist. That's the important part. That's why, as you look at this passage, he pleaded with the Lord three times that he would just be gone. Do you have anything like that in your life? You just feel like, like that person or that event or that thing in my life, that should be taken away, cast it away in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you pray that, cast it away, cast it away. Or we ask God to remove it from our lives. And Paul was like that too, pleading with the Lord that, Lord, would you take this away, this thorn away from my life? Well, let's watch what Jesus told him. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And this is Paul's response. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, and I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities, and he realized this truth, this paradoxical truth. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am sorrowful, that's when I have the greatest joy in God. When I am dry, that's when I experience the fruitfulness in Christ. Jesus is saying, Paul, and I believe he's saying to all of us in this room this morning, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul was trying to take away the problems in his life, that thorn of flesh that he had. He realized that the way that the grace of God works in his life is through his weakness, not in the absence of the weakness, but it was through his weakness.
through people's insults, through people's disapproval, through hardship, through persecutions, through calamities and all sorts of things that reveal the weaknesses that Paul had. For what? So that the power of Christ may rest upon him. He realized he must, he must be weak in himself to be strong in God. He had the new eyes now to see all the sufferings and hardships in his life in a new way. Not just as a problem that he needs to solve and not just a thorn that he needs to take it out, but all those events, all those things were the vessel of God's grace. This is how Henry Nguyen, uh, or the bestseller author, beautifully described about the reality of Christian life. He said, the Christian way of life does not take away our loneliness. It can be anything, our loneliness, your brokenness, your suffering, anything, doesn't take it away. It protects and cherishes it as a precious gift. Perhaps the painful awareness of loneliness is an invitation to transcend our limitation and look beyond the boundaries of our existence. The awareness of loneliness might be a gift. We must protect and guard because our loneliness reveals to us an inner emptiness that can be destructive when misunderstood, but filled with promise for him who can tolerate a sweet pain. Instead of trying to always avoid these weaknesses in our lives as Christians or sufferings, only treat them as problems that we need to solve, God wants us to understand that such darkness of our lives has its important role, important role to drive us to the gospel, to drive us to Christ, and to cherish him at a deeper level. If you're not dry, how can you experience the thirstiness? How can you see a convention like David said, as deer panting for the water, my soul longs after you. How can we experience that experience David had when our lives, when spiritually, emotionally, when we are not dry? When you're not thirsty, it's an obvious question. When you're not thirsty, how can you experience thirstiness? And when you're not thirsty, how can you realize that how, how much Christ is precious to you? It has his important role. This is what Paul exactly meant when he also said <clears throat> um, in uh, 1 Timothy 2, Paul was responding to the, to the criticism of people from Church of Corinth, you know, by saying that all of the things that you speak of me, all of the my weakness that you're pointing out, but he, how, how he's responding to the uh, criticism of opposition was that he was saying, all of your saying are true. I accept them. And I do more than that. I actually turn all of your criticism into my praise items. Why? Because they are the reasons why God chose me. Chose a person like me, like a clay, jar of clay that possess nothing so that I could have everything in Christ so that when people see me, they realize that the power of God rests upon me. This is what uh, Paul meant when he also said in 1 Timothy, he said, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He's basically saying, I am the worst of all sinners. Do you say this? Do you, is that you? Is this, is this how we look at ourselves? I am the worst of all. That's how he looked at himself. And he rejoiced in it. Why? But for that very reason, what reason? He just said it, him being the worst. For that very reason, I was shown mercy, chosen by God, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience, his grace, as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Meaning, the reason why he was chosen by God as a vessel of God is because he was the worst of all. He was a persecutor of the church. So that later, including all of us here, 2,000 years 
later. When we look at Paul, then we can get the message of the gospel. If a person like Paul was accepted, loved, and if a, a person like Paul could be used by God greatly, we can also be. That's the gospel that he was treasuring. And his response was, and now to the king immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He's so praising his glorious grace. I strongly believe that when we uh, die and go to heaven together, I strongly believe that this is what we're going to experience. So, you know, <laughs> sometimes when we look at people in our church or in our lives, or no people, we think that um, maybe that group of people or that person that I know in my life for sure uh, is not saved. You know, I think, or it's not Christian, maybe. I mean, I know that I can't judge that. I can know that. It's really up to God. But, you know, sometimes maybe we think like that. I think what we're going to experience in the heaven is that we're going to see those people in heaven. Why? Because as Paul said, the love of God surpasses our knowledge, meaning it's always greater than we think. Grace of God always deeper than we experienced. And in the heaven, when we see those people, how, what's going to be our response? Are we going to uh, claim a report to Jesus? Maybe uh, something was wrong? No, no, no. All of us will be ushered into the praise of his glorious grace. Amen? You're going to praise him. You're going to praise his glorious grace. Your grace was deeper than I thought, deeper than I knew. And I'll forever praise you, God. That's how Paul was rejoicing in God in the midst of his weaknesses, because they were the very reasons why God chose him. Paul is praising God because his whole life has become a testimony of God's grace, not of his success or how well he does, how spiritual he is, but God's grace. And this grace is working in the same way in our lives right now. When God reveals our weaknesses and when we experience failures, that's when the grace of God starts powerfully working in our lives. When we miss this, we won't be on the same page with God. We will be confused. When God is giving us his grace, we might feel like he's so far away from us. In the season of God's grace, we might say, it's the worst season of our life. If you look at verse 1 of our passage today, this is why Paul, this is why Paul was urging the people he said, let's uh, read this together, actually. Uh, one, two, three. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. He was saying, urging the people, appealing to them, don't receive the grace of God in vain. When the grace of God is working in your life, don't say that God is far away from you. When you look at your weakness and perfections, Horrible things may be happening in your life. Don't say that the grace of God is not here. That's what Paul is saying. Don't receive it in vain. Don't receive it in vain. Because we can totally waste it. We can totally receive it in vain. We can totally misunderstand how it's working in our lives. When we fail to understand that God is working through our worst season, the worst experience in life, the worst people that we met, the worst situation we can be in. It might be the worst for us, but not to God. Amen? God is working through our weaknesses, our failures, and our sufferings. He's working through it. He's using it to drive us to himself. If we miss this, like all the people in the world, we will always wait for the ideal time to come, right? Even as Christians, you're waiting for the best season of our lives. 
the best time, the best moment. We can be just sitting in our lives, complaining about our situations, our lives, hoping that one day our dreams will come true, things will get better, everything will be all right somehow, having this wishful thinking and drinking bubble teas. Just sitting there, waiting for the time to come. During my time at VCAC, I prayed like Paul that God would take away this thorn of my flesh, which is, I mean, not my flesh anymore, applies to everyone. I prayed that God would take away this pandemic so much. I'm confident to say that. I, I am, out of all the people in this room, I am one of the people that really wanted this pandemic to end the most. I plead with the Lord many times. So that the bright season will come both for my life and for my ministry that I would meet with you, not just through uh, this computer screen, that I can really intimately uh, meet with you and talk with you and worship with you and not causing any misunderstanding, but really sharing our hearts together. All the things that I love to do as pastor, I felt like I lost them all when the pandemic came. And I, I was just <laughs> sitting in front of a computer all, every, every day, you know, entering into Zoom. You know, hate Zoom now, don't want to do that anymore. Uh, never learned in my seminary how to do ministry online. Never learned that. All of our staff, I mean, when I looked at Pastor Norman, trying to learn how to do all the Zoom and stuff, it was, yeah, it was a struggle <laughs> for all of us. Uh, I really admire all the staff uh, for their hard efforts. And my point is, <laughs> we could be just waiting for the ideal time to come. And I think I was like that uh, many days. But at some point, I believe that this passage that I'm sharing with you has been really helpful for me to understand that I can't just wait for ideal time to come. I have a sheep to shepherd. I have these people that I'll use, I, I'll use whatever means that I have. I'll preach the truth to them teach them God's truth. I'll meet with them, whatever it means. <laughs> I'll spend time with them whenever they're available. And this morning, I believe that God is telling us, telling all of us in this room, let's look at verse two, I believe this is what God is telling us. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and your day of salvation, I have helped you. Meaning, there is a day that I will listen to you. God is saying, there is a day that I will help you. There is a time that I'll shine the light of my face upon you. I'll hear your prayer. There is a day that I'll pour out my heart, my love upon you. There is a day that I'll give my favor upon you. I'll bless you. I'll show myself to you. The question is, when is that? When, God? When is that time? When is that day? Hear from him this morning. Look at the remaining verse too. For he says, in a favorable time, I'll listen to you. In a day of salvation... I have helped you. Behold. When is that time? Maybe two years later? No. Behold. Now is a favorable time. Behold. Now is a day of salvation. Behold. Now is a favorable time. This is the time of God's grace. Now is when God is listening to your prayer. 
Now is when God is pouring out His love through the Holy Spirit, which is shown on the cross of Christ. Now is the time that God is going to greatly use you. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time that He is putting His favor upon you. Can't you see that in your life? When your heart is broken, that's the season of God's grace. When we experience such dryness, when we are facing our own weaknesses, when we are weeping for all of our broken dreams, that's the season of God's grace. So how can we experience this? What should we do? Should we just believe this? How can we do this? This is going to be my uh, one point I'll give to you, and I'll close this message. Let's look at verses 11 to 13. Let's uh, read this passage together. One, two, three. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affection. In return, I speak as to children, widen your heart also. What Paul is saying, meaning of this verses we just read, is that in order for us to experience now that God is working, the grace of God is working in our lives right now, what we need to do is that we need to widen our heart. Widen our hearts, make room in your heart, in your heart for the grace of God to come in. Don't misunderstand. Don't just complain or you know, look at the situation and say some hopeless things. Widen your heart. Open up your eyes for the grace of God to come in. Meaning, we got to embrace our lives as it is. As broken as it is, as sad as it, is, it can be. I mean, I'm not saying that all, <laughs> all of our lives are sad or anything. I know that you're happy people. But when we face those situations, what do we do? We embrace it. Does that mean? Well, um, I experienced one of my most traumatic experiences in life is when Esther was going through a 30-hour labor. And I was standing there beside, looking at all the process. Doctors were trying everything, and none of them were working. But I was looking at Esther, and this place to every woman. When a woman gives a birth, she experiences the greatest pain in her body, right? But at the same time, she experiences the greatest joy of having a child. Only when she embraces the pain, not running away from it, embraces it. Only when she embraces this painful moment of her life, she experiences the greatest joy. I believe that's the reality of Christian life. What do we do about our dryness? What do we do about our brokenness? We embrace it. Make that as our friend. Walk with it. Embrace it. Cherish it. Don't just say that this is a thorn of my flesh. Take it away. No, no, no. Embrace it. Why? Because that's the vessel of God's grace. That's where God's grace is. Embrace the life that God gave you. Find the grace of God here and now in your life. Now is a favorable time. Proclaim this promise. Own it. Turn your weakness. Turn your failure sufferings into your praise items. Widen your heart, VCAC. Widen your heart. May the grace of God open the doors of your heart especially those doors that have been closed for a long time. I pray that today may God open them up, give you his grace. Those areas in your life you might say that it's dead, it's rotten, it's smelly, it's, it's, there's no hope. Open the door to that area. May the King of glory come in. As Psalmist said, Lift up your heads, O your gates. Be lifted up. Be 
the ancient doors that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O your gates. Lift them up, the ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. May the King of glory come into your life. Widen your heart. Let him come in. Open up your door. Lay down all of your hopelessness. Receive God's grace. Not tomorrow. Today. Right now. Here and now. Amen.